Hi, my name is David Bonneau, and today I'm going to be presenting on observations of debris accumulation and transfer patterns in the White Canyon, British Columbia, Canada. This research fits into the Canadian Railway Ground Hazards Research Program, and so we've been tasked to try to find new methodologies for assessing geohazards, as well as developing and refining new methodologies for monitoring and detection as well as trying to find ways to make improvements to existing systems that are currently in place managing geohazards across Canadian railways. And so my research focuses on the transfer of debris. So what happens after a rockfall has detached from the slope surface and started to actually accumulate in a channel? And so from my work, there are a number of current challenges that are faced by the railway operators. And so in situations where there's complex slope geometry, dense vegetation, and the length of the channel away from the track, all make it incredibly difficult to try to be able to monitor where and how much debris is actually accumulating on the slopes from track level inspections. And so my research really aims to try to address some of these challenges and provide some solutions that can be implemented by the rail operators. And so for this study, I'm going to be focusing on the White Canyon, which is located just northeast of Lytton, British Columbia, in the interior of BC. And so the White Canyon is uh, which kind of spans miles 93 to 95 of the CN Ashcroft subdivision. The White Canyon is broken into a western and eastern portion, separated by a short portal in the middle. And so the Queen's Geomechanics Group has been monitoring the White Canyon since April of 2012 with uh, terrestrial laser scanning. And so the scan positions uh, for our current or current scan setup are displayed with these little yellow dots and the extents are shown with the white dashed lines. And so for the White Canyon West, we're taking basically six terrestrial laser scans to basically build a complete model of the slope surface, as well as there's five scans that are taken on White Canyon East to try to make a complete model with as minimal occlusions as possible. To conduct the terrestrial laser scanner scanning, we've been using the Optech Ilris from basically April of 2013 to uh, September of 2017. Then uh, from that, from 20, uh, sept September 2017 onwards, we've been using the Regal VZ400i. Uh, and basically every time that we go out and collect terrestrial laser scans, we also take a series of photographs with the Gigapan robotic head. And so these photographs are stitched together to generate high resolution panoramic images that are used for visual inspection of the slope, as well as verification of any changes that we see when we compute change maps. And so for this study, I'm going to be focusing on 52 complete models of the White Canyon. So this is basically uh, 52 individual scanning campaigns to collect all of these full surface models. And so to be able to process the terrestrial laser scans, we first parse them and then align the two scans together after we removed vegetation, mesh, uh, as well as signal poles within the terrestrial laser scans. And so the alignment is done first doing a manual point picking, and then we apply an iterative closest point matching algorithm for a fine alignment. After the terrestrial laser scans are aligned, we then use the M3C2 algorithm to perform change detection. So this is a slope normal based distance computation that operates directly on the point cloud. And so once this distance computation is complete, then we can actually start visualizing some of the changes that are occurring on the slope. So the warm colors denote deformation as well as accumulation. So you can see in the channels some of the debris that's actually started to accumulate between scans, as well as the cooler colors denote loss. So basically this is a rockfall events or some ditching events that have occurred between this, the, the, this time frame. And so 
One thing that I would like to note uh, when it comes to debris monitoring in comparison to just purely rockfall is that the change maps provide an overview of the net movement that has occurred between two scan dates. And so if the frequency of data capture does not reflect the timing of the process being observed, we might potentially miss some things between the two scans. And so when it comes to debris movement, uh, all of the debris is not static within the channel, for example. And so it's quite common that the debris movements overprint one another, erosion of previous in-channel deposits. And so in comparison to rockfall, where potentially over a longer period of time, we might see coalescing rockfall events, giving it a sense of a larger volume when it could have potentially been a number of smaller events. We're not going to see the same thing with debris movements because uh, depending on the time frame, it basically the activity that's occurred, we might get overprinting or erosion of events, as well as it makes it really difficult in some situations where in this one, for example, this change map, we're seeing basically one of the sub channels is flushed completely and then there's some partial, um, partial movement in the other. And so the timing and trying to piece out whether a bit of this channel flushed initially, which corresponds to some of the deposit further down, and then this, this channel, the, basically the chain reaction between the two, um, uh, potentially, potentially leads to this kind of chain detection signature that we're seeing at the end. So it's really difficult, especially when it's uh, data collected at multiple months apart. And so with a lot of our scans, um, we're taking at quarterly intervals, especially over the winter months. Um, so there's some uncertainty with the timing as well as any interactions by the rail operators to be able to remove debris that's actually being stored at the, the base of the channel. So the volumes don't necessarily add up all the time either. To overcome this, we kind of came at it with more of a holistic monitoring approach. And so this is to try to look at basically how much debris could potentially be stored in the channel at a given point in time or for a given terrestrial laser scan. And so I'll just quickly go over this. And this is basically states that at time one, we don't necessarily know the depth to bedrock. However, at time two, a debris movement has potentially occurred and has scoured some locations of the the catchment or channel to bedrock, which we're then able to populate into a bedrock baseline point cloud. And so these are all confirmed by using the gigapans. And then as time, time goes on, and basically the channel starts to replenish the debris through rock falls and rock slides, we can start using that bedrock baseline model to be able to get a sense of where and how much debris is actually being stored on the slope. And then finally, at time four, the um, another event has occurred. And so we can actually start to see how much debris was potentially involved, as well as if there was any bedrock incision. And so using this approach with all of the 52 scans, um, this process was performed on eight channels on White Canyon West and nine channels on White Canyon East. And so this is just a example of comparing basically one of the scans back to the bedrock baseline model. And so we can see where within this catchment are, or basically is debris being stored as well as how much of it is there is. And so this is just one of the ways that we can start using this, um, uh, using this data to go forward to try to get a sense of where it's being stored, where it could potentially come down, as well as if there's any sort of trends with, uh, with the location and storage of debris. And so with this, we can also start to actually populate these time series, where basically the black um, time series denotes the estimated in-channel stored debris for that entire uh, catchment or channel. And so the one that we're looking at on the screen right now is channel one on White Canyon West. And so we can basically bring in the rockfall volumes that are detected within the channel. And so Paul Mark will be discussing this in a, in a couple talks. Um, but we basically created a digital rockfall database. And so we're able to actually start linking the in-channeled stored debris with the rockfall volumes. 
So as you can see, there's a marked increase in the in-channeled stored sediment, which actually corresponds to quite a large rockfall that occurred um, over the same time. And then you can uh, see how that material is actually starting to be flushed out of the channel, um, the channel system. And so we did this for basically all the channels, as I mentioned, and you can start comparing and contrasting basically the different channel responses uh, to similar weather conditions or climate signatures that are being experienced in the White Canyon. So these are all of the channels that were analyzed on White Canyon West. And so you can see, as I showed before, channel one, uh, basically showing a marked increase and then decrease, similar, similar signature that's also shown in uh, channel five. However, there's also channels that are basically just in a constant stage of depletion where basically each kind of drop actually corresponds to, for the most part, um, the higher amount of freeze thaw cycles as well as precipitation event that are typically observed over the winter, fall and winter months. And so to compare all of these channels, what we did was we actually compare or uh, normalized each channel uh, by the catchment surface area to try to see if there was any initial trends or similarities between the different channels, especially between White Canyon West as well as White Canyon East. Uh, but this also facilitated a comparison to some of the uh, conceptual supply models that were first introduced by Matthias Jakob in his PhD thesis. And so some of the interesting things that we can talk about from here is that this starts to actually give you a time scale on which some of the, these processes occur where basically debris starting to be replenished and then it's actually being cycled out of the system, as well as the fact that in none of the channels that we observed, we ever saw a full flush as in the case with uh, Matthias's um, model where basically once the debris flow occurs, it flushes completely down and starts to build up again. And so some of this, some of these reasons as to why this could be occurring is that these catchments or channels are quite a bit smaller than the ones that he analyzed during his PhD, as well as that they're all truncated by the rail line. And so when debris movements occur, this is typically when we're seeing a lot of rain, uh, precipitation. Um, and so this events or basically these signatures or settings also potentially could be contributing to more rockfall and rock slide events. So basically the, the signature of actual the channel movement is being muted by the contribution of material being added to, to the catchment. And so these are just some initial, initial considerations uh, when comparing like the actual data to some of these um, proposed conceptual models. And so how do we go forward from here? What is the next steps? And so to be able to actually start using some of this data um, to from like a in, in terms of more of an operational standpoint, I think one of the first things that we need to think about is some of the initiation conditions of the debris flows in the White Canyon. And so this is just a graph of an intensity duration relationship that basically uh, plots the duration of these bursts or basically storm events versus the intensity. So millimeters per hour versus how long. And so what they're able to do is generate this basically debris flow burst intensity plot where basically in a lot of conditions or situations where the um, storm condition actually triggers a debris flow, it's basically above this curve. However, the one thing that I think we should really strive to do is to create one of these, but I think we should also be able to try to incorporate some of the, the geology and some of the remote sensing into this. And so I think one of the things that we need to do going forward to be able to start using some of this data in a predictive and or operational standpoint is to be able to actually use the approach that I developed to basically take the in-channeled stored sediment and bring in this intensity duration uh, data as well, because we're able to then, for a given storm that's forecasted, if we have a sense of the intensity and duration, if we're at a certain level of in-channeled stored debris for the channel, we're able then to see if we're above or below this potential hypothetical surface to be able to see if 
uh, a debris flow potentially is going to be initiated, as well as if we know how much debris is potentially in the channel, we can ensure that there's sufficient ditch capacity, or in the case that the ditch capacity doesn't match the potential hypothetical uh, in-channeled stored sediment, then we could start potentially considering installing further or more intense mitigation measures such as a rock shed in that location. So I think this is the direction that we should be headed, but there's a couple complications with trying to produce some, a plot like this. And so the first one is uh, temporal censoring. And so in a nutshell, the way that this works is that there's going to be, um, we're going to basically mask out potentially activity due to the rate at which we're actually collecting data. And so if there's a long time elapsed between scan dates, we potentially will not be able to see what's actually occurred because of that reworking or basically overprinting or erosion of deposits um, from previous events. And so what you're seeing on the screen right now is basically a full time series of all of the regal data sets that were collected for basically channel seven on White Canyon West. And so you can see basically in the winter, September to December, we're seeing basically a flush, subsequent flush from December 2017 to February 2018, basically a stage or basically cycle of recharge where basically material is starting to be funneled into the primary channel um, through small, smaller events. And then we start to see another flush that occurs between uh, December to March 2019, another flush between March 2019 and June 2019, and then the cycle starts to repeat, repeat again. And so as a thought experiment, we can actually start to parse out subsections of this data set to try to get a sense of what are the possible implications of only collecting, for example, if we're never able to collect in December, for example. So this is just a subsection. This is of the, all of the data sets. But if we were only able to collect in, say, September, but not able to collect in December, you can see that with these new uh, new change detections, we're not actually able to see the, the second event that occurred between that time. So this has huge implications on trying to calculate return periods, but also gives a huge, um, or gives, gives some more context or insight into some of the complications that when you're dealing with uh, data sets that span multiple years, are the conditions in the earliest scan dates even reflective of how they are leading up to the latest scan dates. And so these are just some considerations uh, when it comes to change detection over these long periods. And so, and this is just another case, like if we're only able to collect in September, for example, like how much information is potentially lost. And so this is in my mind, real evidence for the need to try to be able to collect as near real time as possible to be able to parse out what is the actual optimal frequency of data acquisition at these sites. Because we're not sure right now how much data is potentially being lost due to this temporal censoring effect. And so something else that goes hand in hand with the increased frequency of, uh, of the geometry or basically the point cloud data sets is also the climate data. And so this is an event that occurred um, in February uh, 2017. And so I was going to site or to the White Canyon basically every two weeks. So I was actually able to get uh, fairly close scans before and after this event had occurred. And so you can see this nice track basically fully scoured um, the channel as well as it went um, basically impacted the track as well. Um, but basically during when I was able to get back out to track, uh, all the deposit had been cleared. But one of the things that we can do is we can pull in the data, uh, the climate data from basically the White Canyon station, as well as the Lytton station, and start to compare and contrast the different climate signatures leading up to this event. And so one of the things that uh, should be quite apparent um, looking at this data is that the Lytton station recorded uh, quite a bit of precipitation 
uh, around February 9th, where the White Canyon station really did not see as much uh, precipitation or if any. And so this has huge implications on the antecedent rainfall uh, leading up to these events. And so this is, these are just further complications to try to really parse out what are the initiation conditions leading up to these debris flows because we need that resolution uh, from the terrestrial laser scan, but we also need to have a lot of confidence in the weather data to try to make these correlations. So these things go hand in hand, um, but especially when there's as much discrepancies between the two, uh, uh, the weather data, that's something that really needs to be considered going forward. And so with all of this, I hope to have or demonstrated that we can get some insight into how how these debris transfer processes and patterns, as well as the cycles of recharge are occurring on the slope. There's absolutely a further need for increased frequency of data, both from the weather station, as well as the laser scanning. And once we have these, I think it will be a lot, a lot more possible to try to be able to figure out what are the effects in the climate signatures leading up to the leading up to the activity? At present, I only know of three cases of debris flows occurring at the White Canyon. So there's more 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 cases are required to start to build out this to be able to try to get to that uh, in channel storage debris intensity duration uh, graph if that's if that's the end goal. And so hopefully with all of these and some of these processes, it also provides an opportunity to try to fit in how we can start using this from a maintenance standpoint to just ensure that the dishes have sufficient retention capacity. It can be used in a very proactive sense as well. So thank you for your time. I'd like to acknowledge all the offers, uh, basically all of the funders of the RGHRP program, and thank you. <laughs>